Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you're doing well. Um, again, I miss seeing you guys, uh, but we're getting through this. Um, I wanna thank you guys so much for, uh, you know, I graded the assignments for your addiction. Um, you did some really wonderful, wonderful addictions. I truly enjoyed reading um, through some of those uh, and uh, appreciated some of the struggles that you guys had. And so very quickly, let's just talk about the, the rest of the semester because we are coming down to the end of it. Uh, this week, we're going to do a lecture on domestic violence. Um, the discussion questions will be due this Friday by two. Next week will be the um, addiction lecture. And then it'll be your final on May 5th. And what I'm going to do is put the final out on Canvas. Obviously, it'll be open book, open note, whatever you wanna use. I'm gonna open it up at 8 a.m and then I'm going to close it at 4 p.m. So you'll have all day to take it. Uh, it's gonna cover chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 9, 15, 16, domestic violence and the addiction lecture. It's 50 questions, multiple choice, uh, study guides for um, all of the lectures are out there except domestic, or except for um, the addiction lecture. That'll go up next week. What I will do um, towards the end of next week is I will put up kind of a, a final study guide for you guys to, to use. Um, the questions aren't going to be tricky. I'm going to pull everything right from your PowerPoints. So if you get your PowerPoints, you're studying them. If you're using the study guides that are out there, you're going to do fine uh, on, the, on the final. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to me through my email or um, through Canvas. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Let me share the screen real quick. Okay. Domestic violence. The reason that I choose to cover this in lecture is because uh, in college, you know, this is going to be a time when uh, you're going to start having uh, more and more relationships, more serious relationships. Um, and domestic violence is a very serious uh, issue in the country. Probably during your lifetime, someone that you know, um, if not yourself, will experience some form of abuse in a relationship by the hands of a partner. I've got the National Domestic Violence Hotline on there. Uh, if you you know, after this lecture, feel you need someone to talk to, you can always reach out to me. Uh, again, we don't share confidentiality, so that'll be something if I'm aware that you are in a domestic violence or abusive relationship, I will be um, required to report that to the university. Um, I know the university is doing free counseling, so you could reach out there. And at the very end of the lecture, I have quite a few uh, resources um, within the community and on a national level that you could reach out to as well. They're gonna, I think I have three videos that are connected to this lecture. I'm not going to show them during this. Uh, what I would like for you to do is just go to the PowerPoint, pull it up and go to the lecture or go to the videos and watch them because I am going to ask uh, one question um, on the discussion questions about the videos. Okay, so domestic violence. I'm, domestic violence is uh, also known as intimate partner violence, um, but it's a pattern of abusive um, behavior. It's a pattern of behavior um, and that behavior is used by one partner to basically maintain control and power over another partner in an intimate relationship. And so who's affected? Uh, I like to show you know just a wide variety of faces because sometimes we forget domestic violence doesn't discriminate. Everyone in every, you know, people from every culture, um, ethnicity, um, gender, uh, all of us experience, not us, but uh, people from different backgrounds experience uh, domestic violence in one way or another. And then very quickly, since you guys are in college, I wanted to show some of these uh, statistics connected to um, rape, physical violence, um, stalking by a partner, and all of these are can be included in domestic violence or um, some of them can be included outside of domestic violence. And I'll just leave that very quickly for you just to, to have a quick look at the, at the stats. Okay. 
and then one more um, stat. Well, we find uh, so 53% of victims of domestic violence were abused by a current or former boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, so here's one that is relevant um, to you guys. 21% of college students uh, reported having experienced dating violence by a current partner. 32% uh, by a previous partner. Uh, college women, 13% um, have reported that they were forced to have sex by a dating partner. And then 60% of acquaintance rapes on, uh, excuse me, on college campuses occur in a casual or steady dating relationship. And then 13% of women uh, have been reported in college have reported being stalked. And nearly half of those by, uh, were by a current or ex-boyfriend. So let's talk about, um, so a little bit about my background. I have uh, volunteered and worked at MOXA, which is the uh, Metropolitan, um, I, haven't, I haven't said it out loud for so long, I have to see if I can remember. It's the Rape Crisis Center here in town, um, Metropolitan Association to Combat Sexual Assault um, uh, as a hospital advocate. And then I volunteered for Hope House, um, which is a domestic violence shelter. And in my um, current training and where I am practicing, I work with um, sexual trauma, uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, I will work with uh, survivors of domestic violence. And one of the things that um, we go over is something that is known as the power and control wheel. A lot of times we think of domestic violence as the physical part of domestic violence. So it's the hitting, the beating, the pushing. Um, and then we also think of the sexual. So uh, it's rape, it's um, oral sex, it's forced to do things that you don't want to. Um, being shared, uh, sometimes that's in order uh, for the partner to make money. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and one that's gotten that people have become more aware of is the emotional uh, abuse. So this will be um, gaslighting, making someone think that they're crazy, uh, put downs, humiliation, those kind of things. Uh, and then also um, intimidation. So this is making threats, um, threatening to, to hurt the partner, to hurt the children, to hurt the, the pets in the house, threatening to you know, kill the partner if they leave, kill the children, kill the pets if they leave. Some of the things that we don't, um, and a lot of people don't realize are also domestic violence, um, economic abuse. So this is oftentimes the abuser will not allow the partner to work, or if they do work, they're um, forced to turn over all their money to the, to the partner, to the abuser. Um, they are not allowed to be on any of the bank accounts. They're not allowed to have uh, a credit card. If they are, it's, you know, there's like a $500 balance on it. Um, they have to ask for money. They're not allowed to be on uh, the car or the house, uh, anything like that. Um, and then, um, so using male privilege, and oftentimes when we talk about domestic violence, we talk about it uh, in a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman, but that is not always the case. There can be uh, cases of the woman being the abuser. Um, but when we talk about using male privilege, oftentimes when the police are called, uh, the male abuser will make the woman out to be crazy. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, a pattern that has developed is that, you know, the police will go along with that, D DFS will go along with that. Um, but that has gotten better um, over time as more education has come out. But also they will use things as, um, I'm the male, I know better. Um, uh, this is my house. So they hold on to very stereotypical ideas of, of what a man is or what a male is and then how that relationship should be um, in order to control uh, if they're with a female partner. Um, and sometimes also if they're with another male partner, but I'm gonna talk about um, the LGBT power and control will here in a moment. Um, abusers will often use the children, so they will threaten to call DFS and report uh, their partner um, as, as the abuser. And that's oftentimes what happens is the, the abuser will call and report the partner that they're actually abusing uh, and make them out to be the abuser. Uh, 
And so they'll threaten to call DFS, they'll threaten to call the police, they'll threaten to get a lawyer and divorce their partner and take the children and they'll never see them, which can oftentimes happen, which oftentimes does happen, especially if uh, the two are in a relationship where the, the one being abused doesn't have, they've been cut off from family, because um, isolation is a tactic that abusers use. Uh, they've been cut off from family, they haven't been allowed to work, so they have no friends, no family, nowhere to go, and no money. How are they going to pay for a lawyer and how are they going to pay for a good lawyer? Um, so then when we talk about power and control from, uh, for the LGBT community, those of us in the straight community, we see the power and control will. Anyone that is part of a minority group um, faces extra battles. So when we talk about the LGBT community, for example, what will happen is the abuser will oftentimes threaten to out their partner, particularly if they're not out with friends and family. Um, and sometimes individuals from the LGBT community will be out to friends and family, but not at work. So then the abuser will threaten to go to the person's work and out them there. Um, and again, you'll see a lot of similarities in this will, intimidation, emotion, emotional abuse, using isolation, um, gaslighting, using the children, uh, using economic force, physical force, all of those are, are in both wheels. But then when we start to look at the wheel, um, so minimizing, denying, and blaming. Um, so in the heterosexual wheel, uh, what you'll see that is as oh, you're too sensitive, I didn't really hurt you, you know I didn't mean it, you know that I love you. Uh, in the LGBT world, you will hear, hear all of that too, but sometimes what you'll hear, um, for example, say it's a, a male to male relationship, it'll be, come on, we're guys. That's what guys do, guys fight. We've got a lot of testosterone going on in our body. So they try to minimize and downplay the violence whenever they can. Um, using the children. So when we talk about this in an LGBT relationship, um, Oftentimes, unfortunately, DFS uh, workers, social workers, police officers can carry their own bias into their work. And um, so maybe you get a caseworker that doesn't approve of same sex relationships. Um, and so they're going to, you know, be looking for reasons um, to agree with the partner that you are abusive or um, maybe you live in a state that doesn't have protections for same-sex couples and children. So let's say you're a same-sex couple that has um, adopted the children, but the abuser is the only one on the adoption papers. Now you have no legal rights. Um, and again, so then we talk about using privilege. Uh, where we can see this um, sometimes, let me think of an example here. Uh, if we're talking, let's uh, use an example again of a male-to-male -male relationship. Uh, sometimes this can be used in the sense um, where the, if there is a more masculine partner, well, they were upplay their masculinity um, to make the, uh, the other partner look more feminine in a very stereotypical female way as in, oh, they're crazy or they're just over-emotional or they misunderstood. Um, and they will oftentimes try and get police officers and social workers on their side. Um, so that's a little bit of the power and control wheel. And again, this is something that we go through with um, clients. Um, I've gone through it with friends, our friends of friends, because uh, oftentimes people don't know um, all the different areas that abuse covers. Uh, and then sometimes actually seeing it laid out in, in a power wheel. Um, and just simply asking what I'll do is, is show this to them, kind of talk through maybe like, you know, using the intimidation and the emotional abuse. And then I'll ask them to kind of just read through and look at the others and just tell me if they see, if they see any of this playing out in their relationship. Usually that's the only thing I have to say because they will say yes. And then they will start to describe a little bit about how this plays out and how they, how they see these different things in the relationship and oftentimes they can be, it's quite disturbing for them to realize that some of what they've been going through is considered abuse. Um, and other times it's, or at the same time, it's also a relief to know that they weren't crazy, 
that it wasn't just somehow all in their head and this wasn't abuse. Um, so it can also be very validating as well. Okay, so let's look at, okay, the cycle of abuse. And I've got um, a few things here with me. Oh, and one of the things, I'm sorry, I wanna tell you out on Canvas, there are handouts for this um, lecture. Uh, so uh, you may wanna have them stop and print those off and have them for the lecture. Uh, and you might wanna have them with you just, just to keep, just in case it's something that you ever need for yourself or for someone that you care about. So the cycle of abuse. Um, it pretty much comes in in three phases. It starts off as the honeymoon phase. So the honeymoon phase is um, the abuser is very loving, very caring. Uh -huh. And this is oftentimes when individuals first get together. And we're going to talk about kind of the red flags of, of an abuser, but uh, the love bomb, the person, and they are the most perfect boyfriend, girlfriend, partner that has ever been. Um, but over time, what starts to happen is the tension starts to build. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of go through this. So the honeymoon phase, everything is really wonderful. The abuser is very loving. Um, they're very apologetic. They're very sorry, it'll never happen again. I'll do anything you want. Um, and what they do is they oftentimes start to um, have their victim or their partner relive the good times of their relationship. And they return back to the perfect partner that they were when they first got together. Um, and then what happens is this is very confusing for the person that's being abused. Um, it creates a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, you start to downplay it in your head. You can, well, maybe, you know, it wasn't that bad. He didn't actually hit me. Um, or, you know, he didn't, this time he didn't, you know, or she didn't leave a bruise on my face. Um, she didn't attack the children, you know. Uh, so you try to downplay it in order to, to stay because no one wants to think that the person that they've fallen in love with, the person that claims to love them is actually capable of hurting them. So this is a bit of a defense mechanism um, for victims and survivors. Uh, but the victim will you know, usually agree to return or stay um, and they really enjoy the time back with, with their abuser. Um, because it's very loving, it's everything that it was before, and they're hoping that it can stay that way. And they, they try to do everything within their power to keep it that way, but unfortunately, it will move into the next phase, which is called the tension building phase. Um, so this is where the abuser just starts to, to experience, you know, more tension, more stress, um, and this can play out uh, a variety of things. They're stressed about money, they're stressed about their job, they're unhappy with themselves, which is always the case. Um, but so that stress and anger start to build, so that tension starts to build. And oftentimes we hear victims and survivors talking about, it's like walking on eggshells because you can feel the tension with the abuser and they know it's, it's building and they know it's just a matter of time um, before there's an abusive incident. Uh, but usually what starts to happen is there is, um, more yelling, um, there can be, you know, distancing, um, the person might start drinking more, um, threats, um, isolation of the, of the victim. Uh, and then the victim's response is usually to try to placate the abuser, to try and calm the abuser down to do whatever he or she needs to do to keep the abuser happy. Um, if there's children in the house, they work really hard to keep the children quiet and away from the abuser. Um, you know, they try to keep the house clean, they try to whatever they know that typically makes the abuser happy or calms them down is what they'll try to do. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, um, the abusive incident, or in this case, it's called the explosive phase, is going to happen. And that results when there is the actual abuse, the hitting, the choking, the raping. Um, You know, they're refusing to let someone leave um, by force. And so at this point, um, victims respond many different ways. This is when our fight, flight, freeze um, response kicks in. And there's also something else that we begin to realize that should be a part of that fight, flight, freeze. Um, and it's a uh, placate. Um, so it's, it's, 
doing whatever you need to do to survive in that moment. Uh, so sometimes uh, victims will get out of the house, look at themselves, children, dogs, everyone out, and they run. They go to a neighbor's house, a friend's house, a family member's house. Um, they stay because they have nowhere to go. Um, or they know if they leave that they can't take the children. So they stay. Um, and they just, sometimes they just have to endure the abusive incident. Um, sometimes they will try to get away from the abuser in the house. Uh, and sometimes there's just freezing. You, they just freeze and don't, and don't do anything because they don't know what to do because no option seems, seems viable or seems safe to do. Um, and then the other one is doing whatever you need to do to survive. So if that is agreeing with everything the abuser is saying about you, you agree. If that is having sex with the abuser so that they don't also beat the crap out of you, you have sex with the abuser. It is pure survival. Um, and then what will happen is um, after the um, abusive or explosive incident, it goes back to the honeymoon phase. Uh, again, the abuser is very apologetic. Um, they didn't mean to. Um, and oftentimes this is tempered with, I didn't mean to, but you know, I just get so crazy. Or, I just love you so much. Or you know, the things that you do make me react like that. So even though there is apologies and begging for forgiveness, there's also reminding, trying to blame the victim, blame their, the, their partner, um, so that the partner does feel like somehow they were responsible for that. Okay, so warning signs of a potential partner. Uh, let's see, okay. Um, so red flags, basically red flags. And just because I'm gonna go through, there's uh, on one of the hands up, handouts that I gave you, it's red flags um, that signals of potentially abusive partners. And I'm gonna go through some of these that probably aren't on here. Uh, so one of the things that we always talk about is just because someone has one or two of these does not mean that they are an abusive person or that they're going to be an abusive partner. Uh, but the more that you start to see, the more concerned that you should be and the more you should pull back and take time to really get to know this person before rushing in. Because that is often one of the first things that happens. This person wants to be with you instantly all of the time. And it's, and it can be, I mean, when, think about when you first meet someone and you have a crush and you start going out, you want to spend all your time together. You're infatuated with each other. Um, but then it starts to move from, uh, oh, babe, don't go out with, don't go out with your friends tonight. Come over, you know, be with me. And it's like, oh yeah, I really want to see you too. Okay. Um, but then it can be things like uh, telling them, no, you know, I'm going to go out with my, my friends on Friday. Well, Friday night, an hour before you're supposed to go out, they show up with takeout. And they're like, I know, I know you told me that, you know, you were going out, but I just, I really wanted to see you. And maybe, you know, I got, I got flowers and a movie and, and take out, we could just snuggle on the couch. I don't know if that happens once, I don't know, maybe that's okay. Or maybe it's a sign of, you know, bigger problems to come. And that is why if we go back to one of the first lectures that we had when we talk about boundaries, this is why it's important to know what your boundaries are and be confident and comfortable enough to set those boundaries. Because if that were a situation where you were really like, yeah, you know, I do want to stay with you and hang out, but I told my friends I was going to go out with them and I, you know, I want to keep my word and I want to go out. Setting that boundary right at the beginning of a relationship is a healthy thing to do. And that moves us into the next thing. They have a hard time or they just don't honor boundaries. Um, and so if you were to say that to someone that uh, is an abuser, they will do everything they can to, to get you to let that boundary go, to talk you out of it. Um, and at first, it's, it's done in a very sweet way. Um, but later, it's going to be done in, um, they're just not going to listen to your boundaries. You aren't going to allow to have boundaries. And you'll be punished for having those boundaries. Um, excessive jealousy and possessiveness. This is just like, uh, oh, you know, I get so crazy when I think somebody else is looking at you or, you know, uh, when you wear those tight clothes, I just, you're just, you know, wanting attention and, and I just love you so much. And I want you to myself. Um, your girlfriends hate me. 
you know, none of them like me. Um, you know, I just, it's, it's not good for our relationship for you to still be around them. Um, they have a history of battering in other relationships. Unfortunately, most batterers, unless they are forced into therapy to deal with their issues, don't stop. Um, because they don't want to take responsibility for their battering. They want to blame everyone else. And then blames that the entire failure of earlier relationships on their partner. Um, sometimes what you'll find out is uh, past partners will find new partners to warn them. Um, or you'll see things posted on social media or friends of friends will say something. Um, but it's, you know, my last, my last, wife or husband was a total bitch. My last partner was, you know, a complete asshole. They were crazy. You know, they were stalking me. But here is the clue. Most of us in relationships when they break up, especially when we've had some time away, most, most relationships, usually breakups, there's, we've both contributed. You know, we weren't, we're both, we weren't both a perfect partner. We can go back and, and look at ourselves and how we might have contributed to having an unhealthy relationship or what led to the ending of a relationship. An abuser will never do that. An abuser, it will always, always be the other person's fault. Um, and then, you know, here's where the isolation starts. They want you to stop participating in things that um, take away from them. And that's really what it is. Uh, the way they're going to phrase it is, oh, I make enough money, you don't need to work. Um, why don't you just enjoy yourself? Or, um, you know, your dad taught you really, your parents are really controlling. Um, I would never do that to you. Um, so at first they're going to find things that they can twist the truth about to get you alone with them. Let's see what else do I have for anything? Uh, And then often this um, one I have on here is, uh, seems that they may be too good to be true. They're the perfect partner in every way. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And none of us are perfect in relationships. If you have someone that is always perfect, I don't wanna say that that is an awful thing. That would be a wonderful thing. I would just wonder, are you really seeing all of them? That would just be my, my warning there. Um, and then uh, very impulsive shows signs of raging out of control. And this is one, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about it here and I may end up talking about it again. They often blame their rage as being out of control. They have no control over their, over their rage. Um, their, their anger just explodes. Um, and that's often the, the excuse that they, they will say, I couldn't control myself. Um, you know, when you do this, it makes me angry. It makes me crazy. And you know, I can't control myself. That's a lie. They absolutely can control themselves. And abusers are often the ones that are the best at controlling themselves. Because if they were truly, truly out of control, every time they got angry at their partner, they would beat the crap out of them. They would start screaming at them no matter where they were. They don't do that. They wait until you're alone together before they do those things. So they do have control. Okay, uh, here's another one of the, the videos I'd like you to take a look at. Okay, so let me get this one out of the way. Uh, so why do people stay in abusive relationships? Um, and I'm looking at this again, I, I want to make sure that we understand that um, as straight white people, we hold privilege. Um, individuals that come from minority groups or are groups that tend to be discriminated against, uh, it's much harder for them um, to get help um, when they're in an abusive relationship. But a lot of what any, any person, why they stay, fear. Fear that they're going to be hurt, fear that they're going to be killed, uh, fear that no one will believe them. Um, Fear that they could actually be the one that's um, portrayed as the abuser. Discrimination. A lot of times, um, individuals don't realize they're being abused. And part of this is 
they may not realize that uh, the abuse that they're suffering from is abuse or uh, they grew up in an abusive home and this seems normal to them. This is what they think every relationship looks like because they don't know any different. The abuser justifies as the abuse, uses children as leverage, um, you know, the weaponize of social services, the police department against uh, the, uh, the partner being abused. Um, and that's a big one. They isolate their, their uh, partners. They get them alone. So they have no one. Friends are tired. You know, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is how often someone leaves and goes back to an abusive relationship. This gets exhausting for friends and family. And oftentimes what will happen after three or four times, friends will be like, I'm done. I'm done. Don't come to me anymore about this. I don't want to hear about it. I've done everything I can to help you. Stop. Um, and so then they have no one. They've been isolated. You know, friends and family have kind of turned their back on them. They haven't been working. Um, male victims face additional stigmas uh, because we oftentimes don't think of men being able to be abused. And particularly if we're talking still in a heterosexual relationship where it is um, a female amusing, abusing a male partner, um, it's emasculating. Um, oftentimes male victims feel, sh they feel more shame. There are less community resources for uh, members of the LGBT community, male victims, than there are female victims. And that's the next one, lack of community resources. Uh, plays a part for all victims, but anytime we're talking about particularly males, um, transgender individuals, uh, there's even less resources. Immigration status. Um, this is when I was at uh, Hope House. Uh, oftentimes abusers will take um, paperwork um, from their partner uh, so that they didn't have their visa. If they were illegal immigrants, well, how are you going to go to the police? Go ahead. And they'll, they're going to take you, they're going to deport you and send you back to, you know, wherever, whatever country they originally came from. And that's a lot worse than living with me. Um, and so then when we get into talking about, uh, again, in the example I'm using here is the LGBTQIA community. Social norms. So if you remember social norms, kind of um, the things that we, we use in our society that we grow up in to know how to act and behave and how everyone should act and behave. One of the social norms that we've been told for a long, long time um, and still holds true in much, much of this country. Relationships are only between a man and a woman. Two men can't be in an abusive relationship. Two females can't be in an abusive relationship. Transgender individuals can't be in an abusive relationship because they don't have those aren't real relationships. Um, that's just untrue. Uh, discrimination. Uh, again, uh, so the, um, the stat that I have here, 85% of victim advocates surveyed reported uh, when they have worked with a client from the LGBT community, that client um, has reported that at some point along the way they were denied services because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And then we're back to threats um, if, if the person isn't out, uh, threatening to out the person. Okay, so let's talk about stages of leaving a relationship. So I just went too quickly because quick, I don't know if, if you're going to Okay, one I want to say here, I'll talk about it here. Uh, typically, and I think it might be down a little bit further, uh, an individual will leave and go back to the relationship on average about seven times. Um, but it takes a while to even get to that point. Typically, uh, so we're talking about five stages. So the first couple stages, the victim, the person that's being abused is, is starting to realize um, that they just don't feel the same for their, for their partner anymore, for the person that's abusing them. That's typically kind of the first thing that happens. Um, and that gets, you know, as they move from the first stage to the second stage, that disconnect um, gets stronger. The third stage. So this is when they really 
are starting to acknowledge um, the abuse. They're, they're noticing the uh, physical um, bruises or marks that are left. Um, they're realizing that they're isolated from friends and family, that they don't have a job and they would like to. So they're just, they're noticing the, the effects of the immediate abuse, but they might notice long-term, you know, how this has been affected them and how they, they have changed because of this abuse. Uh, and this is when they start making preparations to leave. Uh, and this one, I, that you might get someone in, in this stage that's noticing the abuse and very quickly makes the preparations and leaves. But oftentimes it takes a little bit, you know, just to come to terms with admitting that you're in an abusive relationship. That can be very, very difficult for many reasons. Um, it can take some time to get preparations put in place. If you don't have money, how are you going to get money? If you've been cut off from friends and family, where are you going to go? What if you don't have a phone or all your phone calls, all your um, emails are monitored? How are you going to get in touch with somebody if you were to go to a domestic violence shelter? So you have to get preparations put in place. Um, and one of the things we're going to talk about putting preparations into place, where are you going to hide that stuff? Because oftentimes it's not safe to hide it in your house. Um, and I oftentimes really um, would talk to clients about Maybe not, not even hiding it in your car because your abuser is at any time going to feel justified in searching anything that you have. Um, and the last thing that you want is for them to find out that you're preparing to leave. Uh, so the third stage. Um, so they finally get to the point where, where they leave. Uh, the fourth stage will be going back. And again, this talks about how uh, individuals will um, leave and come back. And we're going to talk about some of those reasons here in a little bit. Um, and the fifth stage is when someone finally leaves for good. And that is um, defined as being gone six months or longer. Why? One of the other reasons why it's so hard for people to leave abusive relationships, this is the most deadly time in a relationship, um, is when the individual decides to leave. So of Domestic violence homicides. So anyone that was killed in a domestic violence um, homicide, 75% of those people were killed um, as they were trying to leave or after the relationship had ended. Okay, so let's talk about um, why people go back and forth, uh, why they leave and come back. Oh, love of the abuser. Again, this is the one I, I touched on. None of us want to think that the person that has pledged to love us and care for us and was so wonderful in the beginning could turn out to be someone that is so awful um, and so abusive. Uh, the hope that things will change. And this is where the, when we talk about that cycle, when we get back to the honeymoon stage, where they play on, you know, they go back and they are loving and caring and, and they take care of, you know, the, um, their partner that they've been abusing. Um, and so this, you know, makes the person be, you know, start to think, well, you know, maybe it will, it will get better. Maybe, maybe things will go back to the way they were. Maybe it'll stay this way. Oh, and one of the things I didn't talk about uh, earlier when we talked about the cycle of abuse. So typically what happens in this cycle, and I think, and I'm talking in, in typical, this is not the case for every relationship, but typically what we see, um, the more times uh, the couple cycles through the cycle of abuse, uh, the faster they'll start going through it. So in the beginning, maybe the honeymoon stage lasts three months before the, the tension starts to build. And then maybe it's another, you know, six months before there's actually an abusive um, incident. The more they cycle through that, the shorter it will get, um, you know, to the point where maybe the honeymoon phase lasts a couple days and the tension starts to build and it's a week um, before the person, before there's a, an abusive incident. When I talked on, uh, so going back to this one, I talked about normalcy. Maybe this is all the person's known. They grew up in a, an abusive relationship. So this is how they understand relationships to be. 
So part of um, helping these individuals is um, what we call psychoeducation. It's educating them not only about what unhealthy and abusive relationships look like, but what healthy relationships look like, because that's, that's a part of the piece that's missing for them. Uh, fear, and then lack of support. Uh, so I think to, let's see, I just want to see what's coming up here on the, uh, a couple other things I want to talk about is, uh, think of any time that you have been in a relationship where you loved someone and you broke up. It sucked. It hurts. I mean, you go through a grieving process. Um, and the longer you've been with someone, if they're children, um, you know, the more profound that grief can be. So uh, this person needs time to actually grieve what they're losing. Let's see. Okay. Something I want to show, and it's not something that I've gone over, and I, I'm not sure, um, and I'm looking at the pyramid over here. So this is known as Maslow's uh, Pyramid of Hierarchy Needs, uh, and I don't remember what chapter it is, but I quickly want to just explain this. Maslow came up with a theory that stated, we have certain needs that need to be met. Um, and unless, and the way it was originally, um, the theory was put together, it was unless uh, each need had been met, you couldn't move to the next one. What we now know is we can kind of move. Uh, we don't need, except for the first one, uh, we don't need um, to have everything met in the, um, the next phases to be able to kind of to move up and down uh, the pyramid. Uh, but so what we're talking about is uh, our most basic needs have to be met. These are physiological needs. We have to be able to breathe. Because um, I mean, if we can't breathe, we're not going to live. We have to have food, we have to have water. A sex is in here for, it's from a, a reproductive stance, more for, um, you know, in order for our genes to survive, uh, we need sex. We have to have sleep. Uh, a state of homeostasis. Uh, and this deals with um, balance within the body. So this again comes back to, the body needs to be rested, the body needs to be fed, it needs to be getting air and water uh, in order for it to feel balanced. And an example I will give you, so think of, if you've ever had a time when you um, needed to maybe complete uh, an assignment, but you hadn't eaten all day and you were starving, uh, where you finally got to the point, you just, you maybe were shaking, you couldn't concentrate, uh, until you met the need of food, you could no longer work on your project. Um, another one might be, uh, and I'll use food, okay, food and sleep. Um, let's say you haven't eaten all day, but you've been working all day and you're exhausted. You sit down at, on the couch, you've picked up McDonald's, um, which need are you gonna satisfy? Sometimes we can decide and we'll be like, oh, I'm gonna eat first and then fall asleep. Sometimes our body decides for us um, and you fall asleep before you can even eat anything. So that's that one. Uh, the next one is, and so those really do have to be met. If those aren't getting met, um, most likely we aren't going to be able to, to even work on um, the needs of the other. And so the idea with this is what you're working towards is your full potential, uh, being able to be uh, everything that you're capable of. Uh, safety is next. So you have to, uh, so the next thing that you start uh, the needs that you have that you need to fulfill, having a safe, having somewhere to stay, a safe place to stay, having safe relationships, um, you know, being able to go to school and not worry about getting shot. Uh, the next one, love and belonging. So actually starting to have relationships. Um, and as social creatures, we know that that is something that we do need. We do need connections to others. And that's why part of this quarantine for a lot of us is so difficult because we're not getting, we're no longer getting the connections with others that we need. The next one is uh, esteem. So this is having self-confidence, self-esteem, respect for self, respect for others. Um, and then finally, so the idea is that if you can meet the needs of these lower parts of the pure pyramid, if these needs are getting met, you no longer are having to spend um, physical energy, mental energy, on getting them met, they're met. So now you can take all of your time and energy and effort in becoming 
the person that you know you're meant to be. Um, you're able to use all of your talents to your best ability. Um, you're able to uh, engage in activities fully. And one of the things I talk about with clients, um, particularly if we come back to domestic violence, uh, one of the things that abusers will sometimes do is uh, deny their victim's sleep as a way to control them. Um, you're sure as hell not feeling safe. Safety is, you're never feeling safe. Um, love and belonging, probably not because you've been isolated from all your friends and family. And then the person that is supposed to love you the most is abusing you. Self-esteem, no. You, your, your abuser has made sure that your self-confidence and self-esteem are so low that you feel as bad as possible and you somehow feel like everything is your fault, you're to blame, you're the problem. None of your basic needs are getting met. How the heck are you gonna have any energy any ability to work on being your best possible self by going back to school, you know, having your dream job, um, you know, being the best, you know, parent that you can be, being the best friend that you can be, having hobbies. And it just isn't possible until um, you can get out of the abusive relationship and, and get help to heal from that. Uh, a lot of what we see, uh, the effects of abusive uh, relationships on individuals, low self-esteem, inability to trust, fear of intimacy, uh, sleep issues, um, loss of hope, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and then there can be suicidality. And then this can, the reason I put, um, if you remember Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. So it's that, um, the conflicts that we face throughout our lifetime. Depending on when you start to experience abusive relationships, this can really disrupt um, how you go on to um, see yourself, see others, and see the world, and be able to function um, in the world. And this right here is the last, I think this is the last video that you'll need to watch. Okay, so how do we help individuals um, in an abusive relationship. Uh, one, and this is one we've heard over and over again throughout the semester is listen without judgment. Just, just listen, um, be patient, be understanding. And this does get difficult if you have someone that you care about that has gone back and forth, um, leaving an abuser and going back, particularly when we will feel like, you know, we've offered to help stay with me. You know, I, you know, don't worry about money, you know, those kind of things. Um, so trying to maintain patience and understanding is important. Don't make decisions for the person. And this is one of the things um, in counseling. It isn't my job. It isn't my job to convince someone, one, that they're abused, that they need to leave their abuser, how to leave their abuser, when to leave their abuser, or what to do with their life. My job is simply to present um, on what unhealthy relationships look like and ask the client, do you see this in your relationship now? and let them explore that and explore that with them. And then it isn't my job to tell them or decide for them whether or not they should leave. Only they can decide whether leaving um, is the best choice for them. Um, I had, uh, when I was doing my internship at Hope House, I had a supervisor who was working with a woman um, who was in a domestic violent relationship. Uh, and she knew, she knew it was gonna kill her. And she would say that in therapy. Um, but she wasn't going to leave. And I, I don't remember the reason. I don't remember what the reasons were, but that was her choice. She wasn't going to leave. Um, so the counselor's job became then, okay, it's not, it wasn't her job to convince her to leave. It was her job to help her figure out how to live as much of her life as she could until he killed her. And he did. She ended up dying. Uh, he ended up killing her. Um, uh, safety planning, safety issues, and this is something that we're going to go over. Uh, but just remember, you're, you are not the expert on this. Uh, so you can kind of talk through safety planning. And so this is why I encourage the person to reach out to local domestic violence shelters. Um, they have individuals that have been trained to help with safety planning. 
uh, encourage someone to, to get counseling, to speak to a professional, um, to help them process through what they've been through. Uh, and here's just something, never talk uh, safety planning or leaving in front of the abuser. Be careful about sending emails or texts about it uh, because this is something that will set the abuser off or if they find it, um, will be very dangerous for, uh, for the victim. Um, so respect confidentiality. <clears throat> it's difficult for someone to start opening up and talking about what's going on because their abuser has convinced them that they are all seeing and all knowing that if they talk to anybody about anything, they'll find out. Uh, so just be careful, just don't repeat what you hear because you never know who you tell it to, how it might get back to the abuser. Um, educate yourself. So part of this is, you know, this lecture is to help with that. And then again, as always, be mindful of your own well-being and safety. Um, you do have to take care of yourself first. Okay, so safety planning. Uh, what you'll find is I have included um, an actual safety plan from uh, Rose Brooks um, that um, I'll you know, let you take a look at or print out, but I'm just gonna go through some of the highlights. Uh, oftentimes we will encourage victims to just put an emergency bag together, some clothes, um, a little bit of cash if they can find it, uh, and suddenly I'm going to talk about what to put in that emergency bag. So uh, you want to make sure that you get all of the things that you can before you leave, because oftentimes if you leave anything like that behind, the abuser will either destroy it or never give it back to you. Uh, so make sure if you have birth certificates, driver's license. Um, if you're married, get the marriage certificate. Uh, if you have adopted children, get adoption papers. If uh, there are any immigration paperwork, visa or anything, get all the paperwork you might possibly need. Uh, any money, ATM cards, any way that you can, you can get to or have cash. Um, house key, car keys. Um, uh, and we, we kind of talk with uh, victims about starting to keep logs of things. So an actual journal where you're writing down um, all the incidents of abuse and you're taking photos of the abuse. Uh, if you have legal paper, so if you do have, maybe you, maybe you actually have left, um, <clears throat> make sure you always keep a copy of the restraining order with you. And you might want to put one in your car, one with you, one at work, because what can happen depending on the um, police force uh, and what time it is, they might not be able to check to see if you actually have a restraining order or an order of protection until the next day. And so there's not gonna be anything they can do if you don't have that paper because there's nothing to tell them that there actually is a restraining order or um, order of protection. Uh, you know, medical records, uh, important phone numbers, um, any custody papers, I think I've gone, obviously your children, pets, if you can take them, medication. That is one of the things abusers will, will do during um, the relationship is often withhold medication but then they will do it once the, the person leaves. So as much of that as you can get into a bag um, in case you need to leave in a moment's notice. Now, the next thing becomes where you're gonna store that bag. You really do have to, where you're gonna store it at home. A lot of people, um, a lot of victims, that's where they end up storing it. Just really have to make sure that it's gonna be a place that your abuser is not going to find. If it can be somewhere else, work, uh, a neighbor's house, a friend, and that's usually better. Okay, so let's say uh, an abusive incident has started, um, and or it's, you know it's coming, it's unavoidable. There are certain areas of the house you don't want to go into. Try and stay out of the bathroom. Going into the bathroom, you've confined yourself to a very small space with a lot of hard surfaces um, that you can get hurt. The kitchen is another one we oftentimes say stay away from uh, because of the knives, pans, um, things that you can get hit or cut with. <clears throat> Uh, try to stay out of rooms that there are no windows, no doors. Um, and if you can, try to get yourself to a room that has a door. So if you can at all get to that door to leave, that that's an option. Um, so we've kind of talked about the paper and money. Uh, okay, so code words with friends, children. Let's say you, you know it's coming. Um, uh, an abusive incident and you are afraid that you know this one 
oh, you, maybe you're afraid of the abusive incident, or maybe you feel this one might be the one where he kills you. But you can't call someone and say that. So you've devised some sort of phrase or word that if you call a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, and you say that word, um, that they will know immediately that you're in danger and to, to call the police and send them over. Um, and then also with the children, it's one that um, if you say a certain word to the, to the child or the children, they know to get out of the house and go to, they know where to go. You've worked out, they're supposed to go here. Um, and they're to tell, you know, if it's the neighbor, what's going on so they could call the police. Um, maybe you don't have that luxury. Maybe you don't have neighbors or friends that you can go to or your children can run to. So maybe it's a code word about for them to run and hide somewhere in the house for their safety. Um, and then, you know, it's, if you, if you feel you really, if you feel calling the police is the best thing for you to do, then absolutely do that. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about uh, the restraining order. There's also orders of protection, just keeping a copy of that with you at all times. The equity will, and this is one that really most of us, uh, even in healthy relationships, no one really talks about what does a healthy, healthy excuse me, a healthy relationship look like. So we're talking about, um, let's start with uh, respect. So it's actually, respect is actually listening to what the other person has to say in a non-judgmental way. Um, and while you might not agree with it, you understand that they, you know, they have the right to think and talk and believe and act in any way that they want and that you have that same um, right. Um, it is valuing each other and your opinions. Uh, it's being understanding and accepting trust and support. Uh, so being supportive of the goals that you have in each other's life, uh, being honest with each other, um, having your own interests, your own friends, um, your own job, uh, and then being able to come back and, and talk about um, those things. Honest, oh, and honesty and accountability. So you're responsible for your own for your own actions, you're responsible for your own words and holding yourself accountable for how you treat your partner. Um, and your, your partner is also holding themselves accountable for that as well. Um, being able to admit when you made a mistake or you're wrong, being able to apologize for that and being able to understand um, why maybe those words or behavior were inappropriate or unacceptable and being able to work on yourself to change that. Um, and being able to do all of this without resorting to um, violence or uh, abusive language or demeaning the other person. Responsible parenting, um, sharing your parental responsibilities, being a positive nonviolent role model. Um, shared responsibilities, so this is an understanding that you are in a partnership and that you each are responsible for cleaning the house and doing the laundry. Um, taking care of the children, uh, being um, available and interested in the other. And how you decide to, and I was going to say, um, because sometimes in relationships, uh, one partner decides to stay home and be more of the homemaker. And that is perfectly fine. If one person is like, I want to stay home and take care of the children and the house and you want to work. As long as that has been reached um, consensually by both parties and both parties are okay with um, how the uh, workload is split up, that's fine. But it's still a shared responsibility of the relationship. Economic partnership. So you both are, are making decisions together. You both are, um, have access to everything within the relationship, so credit cards, uh, 401k, um, both names are on the house, due to the house, due to the cars, uh, you have able to get to savings and checking accounts. Negotiation, negotiation and fairness. With, when we're with someone long enough, we're not always going to agree on everything. We're not always going to want the same things. How are you going to settle conflicts? How are you going to settle um, when you each are kind of wanting a different thing? Uh, so again, we come back to actually being able to have a, a calm, respectful conversation, being able to listen to each other, 
um, and be willing to compromise. And so the big one, I think, through all of this is to do that with non-threatening behavior. Okay, and so here you will see um, a list of local resources for domestic uh, violence victims and survivors. And um, the next one is find a shelter. All right, so that is that lecture. Um, like I said, the handouts uh, for this lecture are out on Canvas under files under domestic violence handouts. Uh, the PowerPoint is out there. Um, you'll need to go to the PowerPoint to find the videos. Just click on the links in there. Um, it is under file in Canvas under files um, under PowerPoints domestic violence lecture. And the study guide is out there for um, this lecture. Again, it's on Canvas under files under study guides. All right, guys, have a great week. I'll get the questions out later, and uh, they'll be due this Friday at 2. All right, thanks a lot. Have a great week. Bye, guys.